morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to STEMtastic 21. We are delighted to welcome you and we are delighted to welcome Dr. Gerno Shearer from Eschool Lab, the physics education research facility at CERN, home of the infamous Large Hadron Collider and the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Geneva, Switzerland. Gerno yeah. is going to- oh, Hold on, quick, hold on. Sorry. You Have you started it, Gerno? We are still in practice session. Yeah. Oh, just, I'm sorry. Just um, you just need to click send to. You just need to click finish. Okay, I will click then. Thank you. Good to go now, Vic. Sorry. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Stemcastic Twenty One. We are delighted to see you here today, and we are delighted to welcome Dr. Gerno Shearer from Eschool Lab the Physics Education Research Facility at CERN, home of the Large Hadron Collider, and the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Geneva, Switzerland. Today, Gerno is going to be telling us all about superconductors and discovering the fantastic phenomenon of superconductivity. I just want to remind you to pop your questions in the chat because you'll all be on mute. Over to you, Gerno. Hello, um, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, um, welcome to School Lab. So today we will uh, have this uh, science show about superconductors, um, superconductors take off. Um, again, welcome. We are broadcasting directly from School Lab at CERN. School Lab is the educational lab um, of CERN. Um, yeah, as I said, my name is Gernot Scherer. I'm a doctor in physics and I'm working in the education and outreach section of CERN. And the experiments uh, I'm about to show you are the ones that students can do by themselves at normal times here in School Lab. Okay, um, this show will be interactive, which means you can write your questions in the chat at any time. I will try to have a look uh, on the chat from time to time and uh, try to answer your questions right along. However, for more complicated questions, uh, we will wait to the end of the show. Moreover, I will ask you quiz questions from time to time about which you can answer on your PC. Um, let's test this right away. The first quiz question. Which of the following properties can be observed on superconductors? A. Uh, superconductors A glow in the dark, B have zero electric resistance, C are transparent, or D interact with magnets. There are several correct answers. Okay. Yeah, answers are coming in. I give you a minute. Okay, um, a bit more time. I think that's enough. Let's look at your voting. Okay, we have the most votes for B, superconductors have zero electric resistance and D, superconductors interact with magnets, which are both correct and the zero resistance, this is uh, this we will observe in our first experiment. And the interaction with magnets and superconductors, uh, we will study this in the second half of the show. Okay. Um, yeah, I didn't share the results. Here, again, the results. So, um, the superconductors, what are they actually? How do they look like? Usually, superconductors are solids 
and I have a samples here of superconductors. For example, this um, cable, this uh, conducting cable, this is a superconductor uh, made of the alloy um, niobium titanium. And this cable is from the LHC, the largest particle detect uh, accelerator here at CERN. So this is a real superconducting cable which was used at the LHC. Um, superconductors can also be more in a crystalline form, like this black disc here. This is a monocrystal, a single crystal made of the of a um, synthetic compound of a copper oxygen um, compound. Um, and we will use uh, this uh, material for all the experiments today. Let's have another quiz question before going to the experiments. Who discovered superconductivity and when? A, Heike Kammerling Onnes from the Netherlands in the year 1911, B, Albert Einstein in the year 1950, C, the US American Leonid Cooper in the year 1957, or D, Andre Geim in Manchester in the year 2004. Again, I will give you about a minute to answer. Okay, um, what I can say to these um, options is that all four of them um, won the Nobel Prize for their research, the Nobel Prize in Physics for their research, okay? Uh, but who of them discovered superconductivity? Yeah, a minute is over, so let's uh, look at the results. And we got the most votes for A, Heike Kammerling Honors, and that's correct. Heike Kammerling Honors indeed discovered superconductivity. And uh, I will share uh, the slide with you. Okay, here on the slide, you see on the left a photo of Heike Kammerling Honors in his um, laboratory. Um, he uh, studied, or um, well, he worked on the liquefaction. Uh, liquefaction of gases, and he managed to liquefy helium uh, as early as in the year 1908. Here's a photo of liquid helium. And um, liquid helium is very, very cold, almost at the absolute zero, so at around minus 271 degrees Celsius. And, I, uh, and on a study, uh, the resistance of metals at such low temperatures, and um, during the studies, studies he discovered superconductivity in mercury. So here you see the resistance curve of mercury is function of the temperature and mercury becomes superconducting at about four Kelvin. So about, at about minus 269 Kelvin, uh, degrees Celsius, which is really, really cool. Um, okay. Uh, what we can so say also about superconductivity is that a total of 13 Nobel Prizes have been given in relation with superconductivity, which is quite a lot for a single physical phenomenon. Okay, I would sa say uh, enough talking. Let's go over to the experiments. As I said, superconductivity was uh, discovered at very low temperatures. So we also need low temperatures here in the lab to do the experiments. And for this, I will take liquid nitrogen which is a, a nitrogen, you know, is a gas in the air, but um, it becomes liquid at about minus 200 degrees Celsius, well, actually at minus 196 degrees, yeah, precisely. And as you see, it is really a liquid, but it's very, very cold. So I should not touch it. And that's also why I have the safety goggles. And we use, use this liquid nitrogen to cool down our samples. We will start first with the experiments on electric uh, on the electric properties of superconductors. Therefore, I will use this small bar from a superconductor. So this is also this copper oxide compound, which has been pressed in this special form, which is very uh, adapted 
to, for measurements the resistance. And you see the silver pattern here, there are for the electric contacts. And we have put such a sample in such an aluminum box and we have connected it electrically. So you, there's a cable going out and this cable now goes here to a current source because we need a current, uh, a constant electric current to measure the resistance of our sample. What do we need, uh, need else? to measure the electric resistance. Um, we have a constant current. Um, if you know what else we need to measure, you can write it in the chat. Okay. No idea, okay. We need to measure the voltage, the electric voltage. And then we can calculate with the current and the voltage, we can calculate the resistance. And to measure the voltage, I will take here this nice big voltmeter and I will connect my sample to the voltmeter. Of course, I have to switch on the current. And then we see that our voltmeter indicates about 0.2 volt, okay? So knowing that we sent, um, uh, the current we are sending in here are 140 milliampere, and we measure 200 milli volt. So the resistance of our sample is about 1.5, 1.6 ohm, which seems not so much, but considering this uh, small uh, dimension of the superconducting sample, actually the resistance is quite a lot, okay? So the superconductor is not such a conductor at room temperature, it's rather a bad conductor, but we have to cool it down, of course. So I will put my row, or the sample inside this aluminum box here in this foam box, and then, I will simply pour liquid nitrogen over it and cool it down. So, as you see, there is a lot of smoke coming out of the, the box or from the liquid nitrogen. What do you think is the smoke coming out here? You can write it in the chat if you want. Is there something burning? Again, the liquid nitrogen is at minus 196 degrees Celsius. Okay, um, I will tell you this uh, smoke, it's not smoke, it's vapor actually. The liquid nitrogen um, um, goes into the gaseous form as a phase transition. And then it's very cold and all the humidity of the air condensates directly and um, forms this water vapor. Now, pay attention to the voltmeter. Look at the indication of the voltage, what happens once the sample is starting to, to cool down. Yeah, the resistance, or the voltage is going down, which means the resistance, which is proportional to the voltage, is going down too. And indeed, we reach the zero. So we see that our sample here is has really a uh, resistance of zero. Very nice. Um, but what happens exactly between uh, high temperature and low temperature? To look a bit more precisely on the uh, dependence of the resistance on the temperature, we will connect our sample to the computer. Therefore, I will take this apparatus here, this is a relay, which um, transforms the analog voltage signal into a digital, a digital signal for the computer. So we'll just do some um, connections. And also I will add a second sample. And here in this aluminum box, we have, so we have a superconductor, but also one with a copper wire. And we will compare the superconducting wire and the copper wire. I put it also in the liquid nitrogen to pull it down. I will just switch 
connections for the computer. What we have also in this uh, boxes are thermometers, measure the temperature. Um, and this the thermometers are just wires of platinum. And platinum is very uh, well adapted to measure cold, very low temperatures. Okay, the connections have been done. Both samples should be cold enough. Or maybe the, the copper sample not yet, but I start already to switch to the computer. Okay, now everyone can see the measurement on the computer. We have the upper uh, measurement is the temperature. So we are at minus 190 for almost uh, degrees Celsius, which is almost um, the, the boiling temperature of liquid nitrogen. So there's a small error, but that's not important. On the lower left, we see the voltage of the superconductor, and on the lower right, the voltage of the copper wire. We see that the voltage of the superconductor is very low. It's below one millivolt. Okay, I said that, um, the, the superconductor has zero resistance. So the value which we are measuring here is just an error. The apparatus is not precise enough to measure actually zero voltage. That's not possible. And we see on the left, copper wire, which is, I think it's still cooling down. So the resistance here is about 20 millivolt, which is also very small, but it's definitely not zero. So the copper is not a superconductor. Now, um, I think the copper is also cold. Okay, what we do now to measure the resistance of our samples as a function of the temperature, simply we'll, we'll take out the samples out of liquid nitrogen and let it heat up at room temperature and measure the resistance of the voltage during the heating up. Okay. Let's start the measurement. <clears throat> we see here on this figure, on the x-axis, we have the temperature going from minus 200 degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius. And on the y-axis, we have the voltage of the superconductor and of the copper sample. We see the superconducting voltage is it's around zero, and the voltage of the copper sample is around uh, 20 millivolt. Now they start to heat up, and we will see what happens. Um, okay, that will take maybe a minute. In the meantime, um, okay, ah, it, it's going, it's starting, so I won't have time to, to talk a lot much. I will check um, the Q&A. You have put some questions. Yeah. Okay, I answered already most of them. As you see for the copper, it's increasing slowly with the increasing temperature. This is a normal behavior of any conductor, which is not zero. Um, this is the so-called ohmic behavior of a resistance. And now look at the blue curve of the superconductor. What's happening here? Suddenly it's increasing very rapid. Yes, you have a jump in the resistance. And the temperature of this jump is about minus 170 degrees Celsius. And above this jump, the resistance, uh, the increasing, the increase of the resistance is slowing down. But then it, it, also, it still increases with increasing temperature. 
similar to the copper sample. So above this uh, jump, the superconductor is not superconducting, it's in the normal state, in the normal conducting state like copper. And um, below this jump, the superconductor is in the superconducting state with zero resistance. And this jump of the resistance at the given temperature is characteristic for all superconductors, for all superconducting material. And with this jump, we can uh, determine the so-called critical temperature. This is the temperature of the phase transition between superconducting and normal state, because um, it is a real phase transition. When we talk about phase transitions, we talk usually about the uh, solid um, uh, liquefaction of, of gases or solid, solidification of, of um, liquids like water turns into ice or water boils and turns into gas. Here we have a solid, we put it down, it doesn't get more solid or doesn't change form or appearance. It's the behavior of the electrons inside the solid, the electrons which fly through the lattice the crystal lattice, which change their behavior. And when the electrons change behavior, we change the resistance. That's what we see here. Okay. Let's get back to the lab. So we have observed what happens to the superconductor when we, when we cool it down, what happens to the resistance. The resistance drops at zero at the so-called critical temperature. What can we do now with this uh, knowledge? What can we do with a material which has, which has zero electric resistance? Do you have any idea for applications? You can write it in the chat. Ah, um, um, what's, for what applications can we use material with zero electric resistance? Do we have an idea of where to use superconductors? At the beginning, I showed you a sample, this niobium titanium alloy. Where does it come from? Do you remember? Yeah, MRI, very good point, MRI. Um, magnetoresonance imaging is used in, uh, in, in hospitals to look into the, in our body, into our brain, and uh, MRIs need very strong magnetic fields. And to have very strong ma magnetic fields, we need electromagnets with a lot of electric current. And when you send a lot of electric current in a normal cable, in a copper cable, it will heat up. And uh, we need so much current that the copper would, would maybe heat up so much that it would, would maybe melt. And that's why we use superconducting cables. In, in modern MRIs, we use superconducting cables, which are cooled down with liquid helium, uh, which is colder than liquid nitrogen. And with these superconducting cables, we can produce very strong magnetic fields. I think in MRIs, we talk about four Tesla, which is really a lot. Okay, another application. Um, think about where I am today. I'm at CERN, and what do we have at CERN? Yeah, okay, then um, I will tell you. At CERN, we have the LHC, particle accelerator LHC. And um, to explain you a bit, I will share my screen again. I will jump. Yep. Ah, yeah, we were talking about MRI, so here's a photo of MRI. Another application, before coming to LHC, another application of superconductors is transport of electric energy. Like here, um, a prototype example is uh, Long Island, uh, close to New York, 
New York is completely powered with superconducting cable, which is about 600 meter long and cooled down with liquid nitrogen. And this uh, superconducting cable can conduct 1,000 times more current than a comparable copper cable, um, as you know it. Okay. Let's go to CERN to the LHC. So the LHC is a particle accelerator, which has a circumference of 27 kilometers. So particles are accelerated to, uh, and um, hold on a trajectory, a circular trajectory. And these particles, these protons, which are electrically charged particles, are accelerated to almost the speed of light. So they are very, very fast. And due to the inertia of these particles, they tend to go on straight lines. They tend to move straight and not on this circular trajectory. So we need a force to keep them on this circular track. And we use the Lorentz force. Uh, we use um, magnetic fields. And uh, yeah, here we are on the tunnel of the LHC uh, with the particle uh, tube. And here we have uh, cables which form electromagnets. And these electromagnets build up a magnetic field strong enough to keep these um, heavy, ener high energy particles on track. And we use, uh, we use superconductors to build up um, these strong magnetic fields. We have here a photo of a crosscut of the superconducting device. And um, these superconductors can produce um, a magnetic field of eight Tesla, which is about 100 times stronger than uh, your kitchen or uh, fridge magnets you have at home. And they conduct about 30 times more current than a comparable copper uh, cable. And uh, if, you would, if you would use copper to build, to build up a such a high field, the copper would just melt due to the strong, magnet, uh, strong electric current. Okay. Now um, it's time to go to the second half of the experiments. Um, but in the meantime, um, I will put another quiz question. And I will use the time to build a bit, uh, to change a bit the setup. Okay. Which of the following materials is not superconducting? Oxygen, diamond, gold, or DNA? Uh, there was a question in, uh, in the Q&A. Yes, the LHC is the largest particle accelerator in the world. OK, you have time to answer. I will clean up a bit my desk. Okay, um, maybe some more seconds. Yeah, let's look at the results. Okay, most of you voted for DNA. DNA you say that DNA is not a superconductor. Unfortunately, that's wrong. DNA can become a, become a superconductor at temperatures at low as one Kelvin. So still colder than liquid uh, helium. Uh, the right answer would have been gold. Gold is a very good conductor at room temperature, but even if you put on gold to lowest temperatures, it never becomes a superconductor. Gold always stays a normal conductor with a finite resistance. Oxygen, oxygen and diamond are both insulators at room temperature, but if you cool them down and if you apply a high pressure on these materials, they also become superconductor. So now let's go over to the interaction between superconductors and magnets. So 
For example, here I have this U magnet, as you know from school. And um, when we talk about magnets, we talk about magnetic fields and magnetic field lines. These lines, okay, maybe I will switch to another camera to show you. So these magnetic lines, we can make them visible visible with these iron chips, okay? You see that these iron chips align along lines in the air. And actually these magnetic field lines is just uh, uh, an idea of our brain to help us understand the interaction between magnets. And when we do the same with a superconductor, so I have here a superconductor disc, we don't observe these field lines. There is no interaction between the superconductor and the magnet. Okay. And uh, yeah, simply because the superconductor is still at room temperature, temperature. So it's in a it's normal state. And what then, what we have to do is simply to cool the superconductor down. Okay, there is a question a bit tricky. Is there any potential danger with the LHC? Maybe I will answer this at the end of the show. Okay, before cooling down, I will put a magnet on the superconductor. So we have here this small magnet. This is a permanent magnet um, made of uh, niodium alloy. And now let's cool it down with liquid nitrogen. Okay. And what will happen to the magnet? Okay, the, the camera has a bit of uh, problems with the autofocus because of the vapor. I hope uh, it will go well. Maybe a bit more like nitrogen. Okay. Now it will start soon. Pay attention. Yeah. Have you seen this? What happened to the magnet? Now the magnet seems to float in the air. Okay. Um, as you see, I can pass the tweezers below. Okay. And above. So there is no wire holding this magnet. This magnet is really standing, floating, levitating in the air and it can turn quite freely. So what we observe here is an interaction, a repulsive interaction. The magnet and the superconductor repulse each other. We can do this also with magnets with other forms. Let's take take this away. A cubic form, for example. Okay. Or several of the small magnets. And again, the smaller one. So we see. This interaction is purely repulsive. But, okay, and what happens if we take out the superconductor here, put it on the side? The superconductor, heat, superconductor heats up again, oh, and the magnet falls down. 
and one it's warm enough the superconducting phase is gone and there is no interaction anymore okay let's put it back and start over i will try to okay. so what did we observe here this effect this levitation of the magnet in a super, over a superconductor is called the Meissner effect. Um, and uh, this Meissner effect, how can we explain it? So this interaction between the superconductor and the magnet, once the superconductor is cold enough, okay, I would share another slide with you for the explanation. Okay. No. So, when we start at room temperature, the superconductor and the magnet don't interact. You see the magnetic feed lines of the magnet can go through the superconductor freely. But once we are cold, once the superconductor is cold enough, all magnetic feed lines are exposed outside of the superconducting volume. And that's because the magnetic field of the magnet induces a current in the superconductor, a so-called supercurrent, because there is no electric resistance. And this current is quite permanent and quite strong, creating itself a magnetic field opposite to the magnetic field of the magnet. And you know, opposite magnetic fields repulse each other. This is the reason for the levitation of the magnet above the superconductor. Now, we do this experiment again, or almost the same experiment, but we take a slightly different sample. Now, what I forget to tell you is that this superconducting sample is a polycrystal, which means it's a powder which has been pressed into this form. When we take a single crystal like this one, it's still the same material, but the, 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 the form of the crystalline form is different. This is a single crystal, which means all the volume of this disk is one almost perfect crystalline, uh, crystalline lattice. Now we use this single crystal for the same experiment. Okay, let's go back to the small camera. So, again, superconductor. Now we take a small placeholder, this plastic plate, and we put a magnet on it. And again, pull everything down. This will take a minute. I will use the time to fill up the bottle of liquid nitrogen. Okay, a bit more liquid nitrogen here. And we should be ready. Are we ready? Okay, now I take away the plastic plate and we'll see what happens to the magnet. Okay. Oh, the autofocus of the camera is not so good here. Let's, I will try to make it better. One second, please. Okay. Okay, what we see is that 
again, the magnet is levitating above the superconductor. So we have again this interaction, this repulsive interaction. But is this interaction really the same as before? I will put this small bar here. It's a magnetic bar on the magnet. That's only to, to hold it and to show you better the effect. You see that the magnet is freely rotating above the superconductor. So there is no physical contact. It's really staying in the air. But now, <clears throat> when I pull on this bar, when I pull on the magnet, what happens? The superconductor comes with it. And I will show you here. As you see, there is a distance between both. So there's some air between. So we really have this <clears throat> floating effect. But um, contrary to the first experiment, in the first experiment, I, I was able to pull away this <clears throat> magnet without moving the superconductor. So there was only repulsive interaction. Now, when I pull on the magnet, the superconductor comes with it. So we have at the same time repulsive and uh, an attractive interaction. You have some kind of pinning. They are pinned together in a certain position. That's why in the, in the beginning, I put this plastic plate to define a distance, a pinning distance. Okay, we can also use something bigger, like this nice aluminum disc and make a turn here. And you see that it turns freely without any friction. So this is a nice application of super, the superconducting state of this pinning. <coughs> oh, of course, if I let the superconductor out of the liquid nitrogen long enough, it heats up and the effect gets lost. Okay. Uh, the question was, was what was what in was what was in the middle? In the middle, I put just some plastic to have an, a distance, a defined distance. Okay, we have now we have observed also this uh, interaction between superconductor and magnet, but uh, slightly different than the Meissner effect. This time we have this flux spinning effect, and I will explain it again with a slide. So Meissner effect was this. Now the flux spinning effect. In the flux spinning effect, it's slightly different. Since we have a single crystal superconductor of a very good quality, the magnetic feed lines of the magnet can go through the superconductor, despite that it's in the superconducting phase, but only on very restricted volumes, so-called flux tubes. So these are tubes of magnetic field, which are going through the superconducting material. These flux tubes arrange in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a pattern which resembles a crystalline pattern. And these flux tubes usually, uh, normally, they can move freely through the superconducting material, but only in a perfect crystal. Here we have a real crystal. A real crystal has always defects. And these flux tubes, they get attached to these defects in the, in, the, in the material. They get pinned to the defects of the crystal. And since these lines, these flux tubes are pinned to the defects, it gives a pinning effect between the magnet and the superconductor. So we have this flux pinning is some kind of pinning interaction between magnet and superconductors. Okay, um, do you have any idea where we could use this flux pinning, a magnet or a superconductor, which are hold together at a certain distance, but don't touch each other, so there is no friction, and they are floating. Um, do you have any idea where, how to use this effect? You can write it in the chat on the Q&A if you want. Ah, there's a question. Is this how the magnetic trains work? 
Okay, that's a very good question because I will make the work a magnetic train today. That's the last experiment. And we will use the flux spinning effect for this. But the real magnetic trains which uh, transport people on the rails, they don't use the flux spinning effect. There are magnetic trains which use superconductors um, like the MACLEV in Japan. There's also a prototype in, in China. And the MACLEV in, in Japan uses superconducting cables to build very strong electromagnets and uses just the magnetic interaction between the electromagnets of the train and the electromagnets outside the train. And thanks to this interaction, the magnet, this train is also levitating has no friction and the, the maglev in Japan can go as fast as 600 kilometers per hour, which is a world record and it can transport people. Okay, so we have almost finished with these experiments. The last experiment as announced is this, the levitating train. Um, I will need some time to uh, change the, the setup. So I will... Uh, Pose the last quiz question. This will be a tricky one. Which are the lowest and the highest ever measured critical temperatures? You know, this temperature where the superconductor changed from the normal to the superconducting phase. Okay, I let you a bit time to answer this and I will change the setup here. Okay, let's look at your answers. Or maybe I give you some more seconds. Um, this was really a tricky question, but um, you could have found the answer with the exclusion principle. Okay, I will uh, end the polling and share the results. Okay, most of you voted for C. Minus 273.15 degrees Celsius and 5,500 degrees Celsius. This is not correct. The first temperature is the temperature of the absolute zero. And the second temperature is the temperature of the sun. B was obviously the boiling temperature of liquid nitrogen and of water. And the correct answer was A, minus uh, 273.15. 10 and 15 degrees Celsius. So the first temperature is very, very low, almost close to the absolute zero. And there are very complex scientific equipments which can go at this very low temperatures, which is still much lower than the boiling temperature of helium. And the second temperature of 15 degrees Celsius, that's almost room temperature, or that's room temperature. And it would be fantastic to have superconductors with zero resistance at room temperature, the applications would be enormous. Uh, the, the potential application would be enormous. The problem is to reach this high temperature. There is one material which can reach this high temperature. This is um, uh, hydrogen, sul sul sulfur hydrogen. So sulfur and hydrogen together. Problem is that you have to put this material under a very, very high pressure. You need to apply a pressure which is uh, three fourths of the pressure of the Earth's core to reach this high critical temperature. And of course, at these high pressures, you don't can use it for any applications in real life. So this is a, a critical temperature which was reached in fundamental research. But this discovery, which was made in, in last October, still gives uh, a lot of hope to the scientists who have 
very uh, one day, maybe not uh, so far in time, a material which can be superconducting at such high temperatures without pressure and without too, compli uh, too complicated constraints. Okay, let's go over to the last experiment. And maybe you can start to write all your you can write to start uh, start to write all your questions in in the chat on the, on the Q and A. We are almost at the end of the show. So here we have our magnetic track. Okay, these are permanent magnets. And uh, when we put a superconductor on it, nothing happens because it's at room temperature. So we will pull it down again. Okay, wait a minute. And then switch to the other camera. So, and let's see what happens when we now put the superconductors on the magnet track. Yeah, we have the levitation effect and they can move without friction. Of course, like this, they heat up very fast. Let's take directly the biggest one. And we can send it on a journey on the magnet rack. Okay. The problem here is that they heat up too fast. So we need some insulation. And for this, we will take our little train yeah, so there is such a superconducting disk inside, and the train uh, functions as uh, insulation. I will put it on the magnet track with some distance holder, and then just put it down. Take a, takes a, a minute. Yeah. So please put all your questions, the Q and A, on in the chat. Since we are using here with this uh, levitation train, a single crystal superconductor, we will have this pinning effect, this flux pinning. Now it should be cold enough. I will close it. Take away the plastic chip. And now we see that our superconductor is floating, levitating over the magnet frame, over the magnet track. Okay. So we have, in the same time, we have this repulsive force and this attractive force. When I pull on it, I feel a force. I think, don't know if you can see it through the video, but if you try to put it on the side, I also feel a force. Actually, I can feel the profile of the magnetic field. When I turn it to 90 degree, the train goes back in the initial position. This is the flux spinning effect. So this is a, a sort of magnetic memory, the superconductor memorizes the exact profile of the magnetic field and will always go back in this exact profile. I can turn it 180 degrees because in this direction, the magnetic profile is symmetric. And also I can move it 
in this direction in which I have a symmetry of the magnetic field and then I can send my train on a journey on the magnet track and it moves as you see without friction and that's really nice so maybe let's switch to the big camera and then I'll show you what we can do now you see here our train levitating train on the magnet track, superconducting levitating train. And the force is strong enough to do it on a, such an inclined track. You see, the train doesn't fall down. It's floating in the air, but there's enough interaction to keep it above the magnet track. Okay, that was the last experiment. So we are at the end of the show. Now I will ha have a look at all your questions and try to answer them. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, really, it's really cool, literally, because the liquid nitrogen is really, really cool. Um, yeah, but I do this experiment almost weekly and every time I'm, wow, that's fantastic. I am, it's uh, unbelievable. I have worked with uh, liquid nitrogen and superconductors for several years. And every time I do the experiment, I'm astonished. Okay, there was one question which needs a bit a, lo uh, a bit a longer answer. Is there any potential danger with the LHC? That's a very complicated, maybe a bit political question. First of all, there is no danger for the public. The LHC has zero danger for the public or people living close to it, or for people working on the CERN campus, there is no danger. The, the, the security levels of CERN are very, very high. There are a lot of security measurements. There are permanent controls of um, all potential dangers. And I'm, I'm working on, on the CERN campus every day. I, I don't, I'm totally confi uh, confi um, confident in the security measurements. Um, if you go inside the sound tunnel, which I showed the photo before, the sound tunnel where you have the superconductors and the liquid helium and the particles flying around, there, of course, there are risks for, for your health because first of all, first, we have very low temperatures. We have liquid helium, which is very cold, so very dangerous, but there are, uh, there are en enough, really enough for security measurements. You have, of course, very high current, so there's a, a the danger of uh, electricity. And you have, um, since you have accelerated particles on a circular, uh, electrically charged particles on a circular track, you produce um, what is called synchrotron radiation. So this is um, our X-rays, which are produced also um, when you go to the hospital and you, you, and you do a, a scan, you also use X-rays. Um, but the control of these X-rays is so good that there is no danger for people. Um, of course, if this, the LHC is, is running at its fullest potential and you are like a meter far away from the tunnel, that's very bad for your health. But when we run, when the CERN is running the LHC, nobody is in the tunnel. Everything is controlled remotely. Okay, I hope I answered your question with that. Any other questions? Uh, I think most of your questions, I have answered them along uh, the show. There are no more questions coming. In this case, I say thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for joining this, this show. I hope uh, you had fun as much as I did. And um, in this case, I would say goodbye. Thank you very much, Gerno. Thank you. That was that was great. Thanks. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.